like to introduce Evan Richards, who comes from the East Troy Railroad Museum, right. correct? And so he's going to talk to us about the um, Transcontinental Railroad. I, I got all excited when I saw that in May it was the 150th anniversary, <clears throat> but we were right in the middle of our remodel, our transformation. How many of you, it's the first time you've been in here since we did the big remodel? <laughs> yeah, you like it? I mean, it's nice. It's hard to find things now, but it'll all come to you, I'm sure. So um, thank you, Evan. I appreciate you coming, and we'll leave it to you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I uh, always like to talk about trains. <clears throat> Usually don't talk about this, but um, it was a lot of fun researching some things about it. And uh, as I understand, we got about four hours of talk. Is that right? I'm sorry. If you can hold their attention <laughs> yeah. long. Uh, I think it's about an hour, and I, I, I've got at least uh, enough to uh, um, <clears throat> last an hour. Well, in 2019, we had a couple of interesting anniversaries, and it was sort of uh, actually mind-blowing to for me to think about it. 150 years. Uh, since the Golden Spike, and at the 100th anniversary of the Golden Spike, my wife, who's here, uh, gave me a uh, copy of the big poster. that They reprinted it, the grand, great event poster. 50 years since then, wow. Um, and then we celebrated the uh, 50th anniversary of another event. <laughs> the Apollo 11 moon landing in July. And uh, I, I was working on the Apollo program. I, I wasn't personally working on the Transcontinental Railroad, although my kids, <laughs> a lot of the guys at the museum think I'm old enough, but not quite. So, um, it just, you know, a hundred years between the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad and being on the moon, 100 year span, and then 50 years since then. That's kind of food for thought. Um, well, let's just kind of put those things in the context of other events, uh, from our Declaration of Independence, and uh, not too long after that, our Constitution, the present form of government. And then, uh, well, a short time, 30 some years, Later, we had the Erie Canal. I guess that was the first really big infrastructure project, although George Washington was working on the C&O Canal in his administration. But uh, that was more local. It wasn't really federal projects. 1848, gold discovered in California. So all of a sudden, a lot of people going to California, wanting to get to California. It wasn't easy to get there. Um, 1850, statehood, and this state sitting out there with all this empty territory, uh, plenty of uh, stimulation and interest in connecting those somehow. 1855, actually the first transcontinental railroad in the Western Hemisphere was the Panama Railroad. It was one of the ways to get to California, well, by ship. Um, you could go to Panama and then go across the isthmus, which was very hazardous and uh, get a ship on the other side. As far as communication, you couldn't do much faster than actually physically going before the Pony Express. You got about a 10-day delivery time for uh, letters, pretty expensive. That didn't last very long uh, for all its fame. Uh, 1861, the first telegraph, and then 1869, the telegraph that was following the railroad, which was a whole lot easier to maintain, uh, replaced the original transcontinental uh, telegraph. And then after that, we had a whole bunch of additional transcontinental railroads, and that's, uh, you can argue that there are even more than that, and there was. Um, some of these were privately financed, some uh, were uh, government projects. The first one in 18, the one that was finished that we're celebrating, 1869, uh, that was mostly government money and was one of the first really big 
federal government projects. Why? Because there wasn't really any settlement out there, any business, you couldn't get your return on, on operating. So they had to get that job done. And there were other considerations. The Civil War was going on, lots going on. There was all kinds of strategic advantages of doing that. What did it cost? Well, the numbers are all over the place, and it's a little hard because of all the complications with the uh, credit mobilier and all those kinds of things. But uh, a lot of people kind of settle around $111.5 million, $112. Uh, in those dollars, the inflation to current dollar is a little 19.6, under 20. So, seven-year project took um, in current money that's 1.2, well, one and a quarter billion dollars. Okay, and that sounds like a lot of money, and it is, but. Um, by comparison, we came down on I-39 from Madison. <clears throat> and that program, although it seems like it's been going on forever, uh, it started in 2015 and scheduled to finish in 2021. <laughs> we'll see. Seven years. Aha! Same as the Transcontinental Railroad. $1.75 billion, a lot more money than the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, another one in the state, uh, the uh, Milwaukee Zoo Interchange upgrade. Uh, started in 2012, supposed to finish in 2022. 10 years, 1.7 billion. So just these two projects, you got almost three times the money that was spent on the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, just to put things in perspective. So anyway, why did they want a Transcontinental Railroad? Uh, a lot of the vision was sort of a global thing. Our, our role as um, in international trade, a lot of trade with Asia even then. In 1869, it wasn't about flat screen TVs for sure, but it was spices and textiles and things like that. Tea. Um, to get from Europe to the United States before the steamships, Six weeks if you were lucky, maybe twice that or more if you weren't lucky. Uh, Europe to the Far East, uh, four to six months, round trip, you're investing a long time. Uh, from the East and Midwest in the US to California, you had three choices, essentially. Uh, overland, uh, Mormon Trail, the Oregon Trail. Uh, if you were well organized and you timed it right, five or six months, and you avoided the, uh, the unhappy natives, which sometimes was a problem, it wasn't the safest trip in the world, um, very hazardous. Or you could go around, skip all of that, just stay on the ship for six or eight months, or longer if you had problems, if you made it six or eight months. Or you could go, by sea to Panama, try to get across the isthmus. Good luck, that was uh, problematical. 30 days or longer after they got the, uh, the Panama Railroad in there. That was a big advance. And that railroad still works, by the way. So, and the communication got down to 10 days with the Pony Express instant with the telegraph. The cost, uh, that trip, would cost you about $1,000 from the east to California, no matter how you did it. So it was not cheap. When the railroad got in, the first class fare was $131.50. The immigrant sleeper was 65 bucks. So you can, and you know, take a few days. So you can imagine the impact. That, uh, <clears throat> the guy that is credited with starting the serious discussion about the Transcontinental Railroad is our good friend here, Asa Whitney. He was a dry goods merchant in the East. Um, he seriously was promoting the idea of a Transcontinental Railroad before just about anybody else. Railroads were getting to be a thing. The first uh, railroad uh, successful like, a, like we have today, the 
sort of the prototype was a B&O in 1827. So by the 1840s, there were a lot of railroads in the East and Midwest. By 1850, we had 9,000 miles of track in the US. So it wasn't crazy to think about railroads um, being, uh, well, to go to California. Now he really thought about this on a trip uh, to China where he was trying to arrange for supply of goods. Took him uh, from 1842 to 44, so he had a lot of time to think about wouldn't it be a great thing to have a railroad and do this in a few days. So the result of that was what uh, is referred to as a memorial wrote, kind of a proposal to Congress let's build a transcontinental railroad. And all the reasons why it would be commercially successful and be good for the economy and all this sort of thing. And he revised it many times, so he was pushing on this. Another guy who's a early planner and adopter is um, Asa, or, uh, Theodore Judah from the West Coast. He's the guy that found the good route through the Sierras. Most of the routes that had been explored up to that point involved going up mountain range, down, and then back up another, and then down. So you had two crossings. He found one, sort of the Donner Pass route, that was one up and one down. And he surveyed that formally and got very serious about it. Uh, had the survey and the maps. He uh, incorporated the uh, Central Pacific Railroad in uh, 1861. He needed financing, so he got these four guys. We'll meet them later, the big four. Uh, people who were serious businessmen and had serious money. And they uh, managed the uh, Central Pacific. Well, he was a little unhappy with how they were going. So he was gonna go to New York and get some financing and buy these guys out because he really had the vision of how this would work as a railroad. These other guys were mostly businessmen and were looking for ways to make money. So he was just kind of unhappy with the sort of the philosophy and the direction. So he and his wife took off and went through Panama. And since it was after 1855, they took the railroad, but he still, got yellow fever, and he died in New York. Ironic, the guy that wanted the Transcontinental Railroad dies on his way to uh, New York to get financing. Well, these were some of the maps that uh, were being drawn in these proposals in Congress and in the government. Some of the early, uh, you can see there's just not much from here uh, to here. And uh, here's one of the problems. I have a they got into uh, the government and uh, Congress and they talked about it and the War Department was kind of in charge of these surveys and they were doing more serious surveys. And uh, this map here, this is 1855 map, <coughs> updated in 1857, Honorable Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War. Yeah, that's the Jefferson Davis. So, <coughs> folks from the South, didn't want a route that was going to help the North, and, and vice versa. So they could never agree on a route. No way, no how. Until this little disagreement we had with, uh, amongst our states that started in 1861 with this gentleman being elected, and all the Southern senators left. And after successfully trying to, or unsuccessfully trying to get the Pacific Railroad Act passed, and um, you know, it's just strange to think of a Congress that can't pass anything. I mean, what a horrible <laughs> thing. I mean, we wouldn't put up with that now, would we? No. <laughs> well, anyway, it failed in 1868, 1861, and Lincoln's, it passed, and Lincoln signed it on the 1st of July, 1862. This is a picture of our friend Abraham Lincoln in 1862. Um, that was an incredibly productive Congress. On the same day that he signed the Pacific Railroad Act, he signed the first, and you'll, you all love this, the first uh, really effective Internal Revenue Act for income tax. Yeah! I'm not hearing the enthusiasm and the love here. 
That was amazing. Well, they needed the money for the railroad and the war and lots of stuff going on. The, second, the day after that, he signed the Morrell Land Grant College Act. So all the big land grant colleges. You know. um, later in that same month, he reads his first draft of the Emancipation Con uh, Proclamation to his cabinet. And have you been to the Lincoln Museum in Springfield? They've got a whole room that sort of sets that up. And Lincoln is at one end of the room reading it. And some of the cabinet members are kind of distressed to hear this. They're sitting there like this. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a great place. To, anyway, also on this, uh, that Congress, they passed um, the Homestead Act, the deal where you get 160 acres if you go out there and try to settle it. So a lot going on. And this, when looking at this, what, what was happening in this period, the stuff with the war is amazing. So it's just an amazing time. Anyway, they were able finally to agree on this central route. Um, let's start to meet some of the characters here. Um, Thomas Clark Durant, MD. He, he actually was an MD. He got his, uh, graduated with honors from, uh, let's see, it was uh, Albany Medical College in 1840. He was actually an assistant professor of surgery there for a while. But unlike now, I guess there wasn't a lot of money to be made in the medical world. So he got interested in Oh, he's had family members selling grain, and he got into that, and then that led him into being interested in railroads. And he discovered that there was a lot of money to be made in building railroads. And he was mostly interested in making the money building the railroad. Didn't really care too much about operating the railroad or ending up with a railroad that was useful to actually operate, but that, that was him. He had a lot of money. Uh, he got a charter for something called the Missouri and, or the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad. Got that charter in 1853 to build across Iowa from Davenport to Council Bluffs. He was a friend of Abraham Lincoln. He got friendly with Abraham Lincoln because the M&M, Missouri, his railroad across Iowa, was connecting with the Rock Island and they were building a bridge, first bridge across the Mississippi River, so-called government bridge, because it went across uh, an island that was owned by the government, it was an arsenal or armory or something. The steamboat folks weren't real happy about a bridge being uh, built across the Mississippi River, and they sued. Uh, Durant heard that there's this guy, in, you know, attorney in Illinois that was pretty good for that kind of stuff, and he understood infrastructure and knew his way around politics in the courtroom, and hired him, and Lincoln won the suit. And so they got to know each other. And in the course of uh, knowing each other, uh, they both visited Council Bluffs together. And Durant was saying, wouldn't this be a great place having the charter for the railroad going to Council Bluffs, wouldn't this be a great place, Abe, to uh, start the uh, Transcontinental Railroad if we ever get one? And oh, by the way, um, Abraham Lincoln ended up with property in Council Bluffs somehow. Well, not quite sure how that happened. Apparently, he accepted some lots as security for some work he was doing. Might have been Durant. I don't know. Later, when he signed that Pacific Act and made the proclamation, it was left up to the president to actually make an executive order where it was. He said, okay, it's gonna start in Council Bluffs. He said, and he admitted, I own property there, but still, that's the place. To, okay. I guess the takeaway is that these figures that we think are so great and you know, statues and icons, eh, they're human too, you know? They, yeah, you make a little money on the side here, that's okay. Anyway, um, so he got to know Lincoln, and they were pretty tight. And uh, 
So, but the problem was old Durant here was more interested in kind of fooling around and, and making deals and changing things and making money than actually getting the railroad built. So he did not get that railroad built to Council Bluffs. Uh, he was beat in that uh, respect by uh, something called the uh, Cedar Rapids and Missouri Railroad that was associated with the Galena and Chicago Union, which was the precursor of the Chicago Northwestern. Well, it all pretty quickly got merged into the CNNW, but when he still had the M&M, &M, and Lincoln had signed the deal that was going, the railroad was going to start in Council Bluffs. Of course, the Galena and Chicago Union and that stock went way up. His M&M &M stock went way down. So what did old Durant do? The whole management and the government inspectors, and actually his chief engineer, we'll meet him in a second, um, Peter Day, had already surveyed a line. It had been approved by the government. They actually had started work on it. They were working on the bridges. But what does Durant do? The first set of rails and ties and spikes and everything he has um, delivered to Bellevue. Bellevue? What? Well, that was in his new plan where he was going to have his M&M Railroad go. Aha. Uh -huh. So as soon as the word got around, you know, just days, oh my God, they're going to start at Bellevue. And Durant didn't uh, discourage that rumor. Stock in the m and goes way up. He sells that stock. He buys stock in the, uh, the uh, Cedar Rapids in uh, Missouri, goes way down because, oh my God, I thought we were going to Council Bluffs, but no, I guess not, huh? He buys that. And he said, oh, yeah, right, you, you guys are right, my mistake. Uh, ship the stuff up to Council Bluffs or Omaha, we'll start there. He made five million bucks in a week. And this is 1863, four money, yeah. That's, Tom, that's Durant. What a guy. Ah. Anyway, his first, um, this is one of the very good guys in this story. There's not too many, actually. Uh, <laughs> Peter Day, he was um, the engineer in charge of the surveys. And he did a great survey. It got approved and everything. Uh, you see he was in that job for two years. Um, and here's his map. Uh, here's uh, Council Bluffs right here. It's a little ways from the river. And he's going to start the railroad. They were thinking the bridge eventually would be up here somewhere. And kind of a nice, you know, straight out here to the Platte Valley, and then best grade, you know, and they had it approved and started and everything. And he submitted an estimate to uh, Durant. Um, he thought it was going to be $27,000 a mile for this section. Um, and he thought it would kind of vary depending on the detail of the section, this is for the first 100 miles, between 20 and 30,000. So he, he suggested Durant make it 30,000. Durant says, no, 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 change it, uh, change your map so that you show bigger grades and tougher stuff and uh, make it 50,000. And they said, what, 50? No, no, he wasn't gonna do that. Well, that's was his orders. Um, he, um, let me skip ahead here a little bit. This, by the way, is uh, where this um, Belleville is right, or Bellevue, uh, down in the corner a little bit south of, uh, let's see, Omaha is, is up here a little bit. Um, but that's where that, um, and there was no railroad at the time. Uh, actually there or even really planned. But uh, what um, Durant did, he got a couple guys, uh, Silas Seymour, who wasn't a very good engineer, um, to kind of lay out this, you know, some other things and, and look at the estimates and everything. And this guy, uh, Hoxie, 
um, you've got to put uh, quotes around this because uh, this guy never looked at the land he was proposing on this map. He actually drew a map that had a bigger oxbow so they could get more miles in this. And uh, Hoxie, uh, on Dur Durant's direction, submitted the bid at uh, $50,000 a mile, which was quickly approved by a couple of, you know, subcommittee of the board under Durant. And then Hoxie was told to transfer the contract to this new company that Durant had started, Credit Mobilier, one of the first companies in the U.S. to operate under the brand new limited liability scheme. So if you're a director in a the company, they can't come after you for your house and all your stuff, just what you got in it. So if you keep your investment low, eh. okay. So the Credit Mobilier was going to be the independent contractor that was going to build the railroad and then submit the bills to the UP. Government auditors, yep, that's, that's an honest bill. And, you know. That whole scheme wasn't blown until long later, but uh, anyway. So when, <laughs> when Peter Day was told that he had to uh, change his estimate, he wouldn't do it. And um, he submitted a letter of uh, resignation to the, oh, actually he copied the government, um, the, the person from the federal government who was in charge of approving all these payments and everything. It says, my views of the Pacific Road are perhaps peculiar. I look upon its managers as trustees of the bounty of Congress. You're doubtless uninformed of how disproportionate the amount is to be paid to the work I contracted for. I need not expatiate on the sincerity of my course when you reflect on the fact that I have resigned from the best position in my profession this country has offered to any man. And that is absolutely true. But he wouldn't have any part of this uh, playing games and stuff. Uh, Silas Seymour. Uh, this is one of his designs, the uh, Cascade Creek Bridge. Uh, when that got done, uh, the speed limit was four miles an hour. Okay, it's a great design. Here's his, um, here's his route from, here's Council Bluffs, here's Omaha, here's Bellevue down here. This is Mr. Mr. Seymour. Who is, uh, where is that? Yeah. Map submitted by Simon Seymour, consulting engineer. <laughs> consulting engineer. Uh, instead of, here's the original route that uh, Peter Day had laid out $27,000 a mile. There's uh, Silas Seymour's route. <laughs> you get a few extra miles. And by the way, they tacked on extra miles at it was supposed to be the first 100 miles they added more so at 50 grand. And then, oh, here's an option. Yeah, we can go down here to Bellevue. And then, probable connection to M&M. &M. Eh, not so much. Never had an improbable connection. They kind of hedging their bets. Anyway, the guy, he was a constant thorn in the site for the whole uh, construction of the guy that they hired and by the way, that was a big political issue that who's going to be the chief engineer? Um, well, Grenville Dodge ended up with it, and he was kind of the natural. He, uh, uh, by this time, General Grant's uh, political stock was rising, of course, after the war. And uh, he worked with Grant. He was in the Army and created a, a military intelligence gathering unit, kind of with modern features. Maybe the first really good military intelligence. Uh, so he was pretty good. He was also had political skills. He was a delegate to the convention in 1868 that uh, nominated Grant. So with Grant coming in as president, and, you know, likely, uh, yeah, why not? 
Grenville Dodge. And he was a good engineer. He was very good. But uh, this guy Seymour was a thorn in his side. Grant, or Grenville Dodge uh, kind of saw what was going on. And he was able to make sure he was financially in good shape. Uh, his house in Council Bluffs is here. That's not bad for a chief engineer. Uh, after they built the Transcontinental Railroad, they, uh, he built railroads in Mexico, Cuba, Germany, France. He even helped with the Trans-Siberian Railroad and got an award from the Tsar. And uh, when he w was later, one of the last things he did, he was the chief engineer of the Texas and Pacific Railroad starting in Marshall, Texas. Uh, he set up a scheme kind of like the uh, Credit Mobilier, only he did it better. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, this is his house in Council Bluffs. It's a, it's a landmark. Anyway, after a while, they kind of got tired of Durant's uh, shenanigans and not getting the railroad done. Um, so there was a, a bit of a revolution. And they put in Oliver Ames as president. And one of his qualifications is he was the brother of Oakes Ames, who is a member of Congress, who uh, took over uh, as head of the Credit Mobilier. Um, and, um, you know, and things started to work very well. By the way, this is the Ames that Ames, Iowa is named after. Okay. Even though that's not on the, uh, I guess it was. It, it was on the Northwestern, wasn't it? Ames on the Northwestern, yeah. Um, okay. So the United States paid the Union Pacific uh, 94.6 million total. The credit mobilier costs for that work were 50.7 million. It's about a, you know, 100% markup. Um, Credit Mobilier actually only reported a profit of 23.4. Where's the other 20.6? Yeah, it's business. The story finally broke. These guys all were fighting during the building and afterwards. So make a note for yourself. You're going to have a really crooked scheme. All the people that are involved need to be kept happy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have any unhappy people in your scheme. This is one thing that Grenville Dodge learned. Okay, So they left some unhappy people, which anything that Durant was involved in is very likely. So Congress, after an article in the New York Sun, started to expose what was going on. They started an investigation. And as we know, Congressional investigations are always completely thorough <laughs> and transparent and get every, all the facts out. And, and as it was with the Wilson investigation, there's a lot of congressmen involved, including Oakes Ames, who was a congressman, and he was sort of the paymaster. And I, I just couldn't believe this one. I, I found this about two weeks ago in a book his defense, when he was accused of being involved in something shady in this credit mobilier, he said he was selling stock at par. Par, there was just this, this value that was assigned, which is way below the actual market value. He was selling stock at par to other congressmen. Well, the first thing he said was, you're accusing me of bad stuff here. First of all, it's not against the law to own stock or to sell stock. No law, no criminal act, nothing to see here. Now, these stock sales, some people say it was a bribe. <laughs> this Oaks Ames said this in 1872. I can't it's not a bribe because there was no, wait for it, quid pro quo. <laughs> Is there anything new under the sun, folks? No. No, he said, this wasn't about bribing, this is about friendship. We don't have to bribe our friends. The more important note that he sort of uh, shared was that 
you know, I have detailed notes of all these stock sales, numbers, dates, names. Wilson committee said, well, yeah, nothing to see here. Uh, and so he kind of got off. Okay, let's go to the West Coast. The big four. Uh, these are the guys that were recruited by Judah, remember, and he, he wanted to buy them out, but he didn't make it. Stanford, Huntington, Hopkins, and Crocker. Let's meet these guys. Leland Stanford, uh, he was the president of the Central Pacific. He was also a senator and a governor, kind of politically connected. Uh, he uh, ended up founding Stanford University. That's the Stanford. Um, here's his mansion on Knob Hill in California Street. Wow. The mansion being built next door is another of the big four, Mark Hopkins. Okay. Now, um, the Stanford Court Hotel is now on this site. All these burned down in the 1906 earthquake and fire. Okay, that's one of the big four. Number two, Collis Huntington. He's the vice president of the Central Pacific. Now he's the, <laughs> he's the Oak Ames. He's the guy that's in, a, in Washington making sure everybody's happy and that the uh, interests of the Central Pacific are being looked after. Uh, he started the C&O Railroad after his time at the, on this. And where was that? The C&O? Yeah. That was where the, uh, let's see, that's in Virginia? From, um, it, it was in the east, yeah. Um, Mr. Huntington, when he died in 1900, he was worth $1.6 billion. Now, the, uh, on the West Coast, no credit mobilier, no. It was called the Contract and Finance Company. Completely independent, of course. Now, in 1872, when this Wilson investigation started, uh, Mr. Huntington decided it was time to uh, reorganize the San Francisco, or the, uh, I think it was the Sacramento offices of the Central Pacific. Railroad was growing, a lot of business, they needed space. So they cleaned out a lot of the old files. Many, many years of those C and P, oh, that's old stuff. You know, he's getting all these news, he burned them. Very soon after, like right after the ashes were cooling, he, uh, Huntington was summoned to Congress. He appeared on July 28th. Uh, and he apologized. He just, unfortunately, I just don't, I don't, we don't have the books anymore. We, sorry. Okay, how much did they make away with? Uh, some people say as low as 100 million. Um, some of the upper estimates are 211 million. We don't know. That's the little Huntington mansion that burned in 1906. That's uh, Huntington Park now. Number three of the big four, Mark Hopkins, he was the treasurer. That burned down in 1906. Um, here's a better shot of it. Um, that cost three and a half million dollars to build in 1878. That's 95 million in today's dollars. Number four, Charles Crocker. He was the construction supervisor, and he's the guy that started the Southern Pacific Railroad. There's his mansion. That's where Grace Cathedral now sits. Uh, he built another one next door for his son, William. It's a wedding gift. William was an art collector. He particularly liked Degas. He had 35 Degas paintings, all of which were lost in the fire in 1906. So if you took all those mansions together, they probably don't, if, if you had those paintings today, they would be worth more. Okay, just a review. Here's um, 
the Transcontinental Railroad starting at the uh, Omaha Council Bluffs. The blue is the Union Pacific, the red is the Central Pacific, and the green is what was added shortly after the opening to bring the line to Oakland and actually get it to the West Coast, so just to get our mindset. So here's what uh, some of the construction on the uh, Union Pacific um, looked like. Now, if you want to know what part of the Transcontinental Railroad you're looking at, uh, kind of look at the quality of the roadbed and the ties. The uh, Union Pacific used hewn ties, which were not very uniform. The Central Pacific used sod ties. We'll see that in a minute. Here's that Cascade Bridge of uh, Seymour's after they uh, fixed it up a little bit to get it to work. Uh, that was replaced not long after with this very robust, um, look at that. And look at the um, support for those spans, the cables and the turnbuckles and all of that. Uh, then that, the next iteration replaced that with actual girders. And nowadays they don't use that section. There's a nice, um, video clip on the, I think it's the PBS website, uh, the guy walking around on these foundations, which are still there. The line nowadays is, is nearby, but not there. This is the Central Pacific. Now you can tell the Central Pacific, look at the ties, they're nice, uniform, sawed, real ties. Uh, better ballast better road bed, um, just in general, higher grade construction. This is one of their trestles. Uh, you can see a, a lot of their uh, labor were Chinese. Well, you just couldn't get any others. And it turned out, oh, this was a huge, you could talk about this subject. Uh, Chinese were very effective, very productive workers. They also took care of themselves better. They, were, you know, they had some hygiene habits. They, they cooked really good stuff, and they were healthier. So they were much more productive. And they worked for a lot less money. They were exploited, but anyway. Um, Central Pacific also, because they went through the mountains, they built snow sheds. This is some awesome timbers here <laughs> that uh, uh, would keep the snow from piling up. So they kind of built those by where they thought they would need them and uh, just kind of by experience and so on. When it was getting toward the end of things um, <clears throat> and uh, the exact meeting point hadn't been worked out, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific got into a bit of a contest of who can lay the most track in, the, in a day. So the UP started off, I don't know, four miles and then CP did five point something and went back and forth. Well, Crocker decided, okay, we're gonna settle this. And he organized <clears throat> the most amazing day. And he wanted to do it as close to the end as he could so that the Union Pacific had no opportunity. Yeah. So he says, okay, we're gonna do 10 miles. And so on uh, April 28th, which is what, slightly more than a week before the Golden Spike, they laid 10 miles of track in one day. Actually, 10 miles and 185 feet. They did it in 12 hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, Union Pacific said, well, they cheated. They pre-placed ties along the way. But that was okay because everybody did that. You, you have ties out there. <clears throat> but they had these gangs that would go along and one guy would put the pound the spikes in on one side on one uh, tie and then go up to the next rail, do the same thing on the next and so on. So they had these huge gangs organized to do that and big organization to get the track, the rails out there. And it was an amazing thing. They even stopped for lunch at a place called uh, Camp Victory. And this is on the day of this 10 miles of construction. And here's the Stowbridge, the CP supervisor. This must be some of the 
flat cars they used for rails. But they had lunch, and then they finished up. Uh, anyway, okay. So, uh, we're getting close to the actual golden spike. This is Stanford's train uh, getting, eh, he's still a ways from uh, Promontory. His cars were, this was a regular train. This is his uh, supplies. Plenty of uh, hooch and uh, adult beverages. And that's his private car. Uh, he also had fresh strawberries, uh, fruit, seafood that was packed in Alaskan ice. So, yeah, that was okay. Meantime, uh, Durant, uh, being kind of the showboat guy, uh, the UP organization was involved in the most incredible political mess uh, back in East, and they were fighting and lawsuits and injunctions and everything. So, but Durant wanted to go to the ceremony, so he did. And he got as far as uh, Piedmont, Wyoming. It's in the southwest corner of Wyoming. This is a contemporary picture of Piedmont. Building's still there, but not much. A uh, bunch of uh, contractors who had not been paid, knew he was coming, piled a bunch of ties up when the train rolled in and stopped. Armed guys from these contractors had the crew at gunpoint unhook his car, put it on a siding where these guys put a pile of ties in front of it, a pile of ties in back of it. And they said, okay, now we can talk. You owe us money. And uh, Durant was not happy. So he telegraphed Dodge. He says, these guys want money. So Dodge uh, worked for Grant, knew the Army, was well connected. He said, hey, well, we're going to we'll get the Army out here. We'll get this settled. So he sent a telegram to one of his general buddies at the fort, which was not too far from here. Send the Army, get this straightened out. One tiny little problem. The telegraph operator at Piedmont <clears throat> kind of disconnected everything. Uh, Grant, or, uh, Dodge was on the west. He sent this thing. The telegraph operator gave it to one of the conspirators. What do you think of that? Oh, not so much. Send a message back saying, uh, you want to get us money? We'll let those messages go through this kind of stuff. No. Oh, okay. Anyway, they got the money for these guys. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, Durant sent the telegram. The, the ceremony was supposed to be on the 8th, on a Saturday. Stanford got there on the 7th. And by that time, they just got the word from Durant, nah, I can't make it, uh, Monday. We'll, we'll, we'll be there Monday. So they're on their way, and they get to this wonderful place. Uh, the temporary bridge at uh, Devil's Gate and Weber Canyon washed out or got messed up. And so they had crews working all night to make enough repairs. They didn't think they could handle the weight of the engine. So they unhooked the cars and they hauled them across by ropes. Okay. So the engine... The, from the Union Pacific side, the 119 just happened to be an engine that was west of this bridge. And they brought that in. And uh, so, yeah, it was uh, tough getting there. Anyway, when they got there, um, this is some of the Union Pacific guys, uh, the engineering crew, getting all dressed up for the ceremony. Some nice looking cars, aren't they? Yeah, anyway. So, <clears throat> about those engines. Here's the, um, the 119. Uh, this is a replica that the Park Service built. They reenact this frequently at the Promontory Summit, which uh, they, they rebuilt the rails in that area. It's not connected to the railroad now. So, that's the Union Pacific engine. Uh, it burned coal, actually. Here's a picture of that engine back in the day. Not uh, 
at the at Promontory, but you can see coal in the tender. There was coal on the uh, Union Pacific line. Um, here's the Central Pacific engine. Um, that burned wood. That's the, that's the Jupiter. And here's a picture of Stanford's train. I think this is at uh, Monument Point when he was just waiting for uh, the Union Pacific guys to show up. This was on a Sunday. They did this on a Monday, uh, the, the ceremony. And Monument Point, where Stanford was chilling out, was up here. This is Promontory Summit. Sometimes they say Promontory Point. No, 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 no. Promontory Point is down here. See, this whole area is Promontory. This is on the new, as of 1904, Lucian Cutoff, which is a flatter route. So <clears throat> anyway, another map of it. Here's a, here's a photograph of what it looked like putting in the last rail. Uh, this is on the CP side. And one of the few pictures you can see of Chinese laborers, here's one, here's another, with their tools actually getting things lined up. And there is a track gauge here. So Union Pacific 119 in the background. So you can always tell which side you're looking at. Uh, OK, pop quiz, what side are we on now? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so they're getting ready. It's getting close. They're getting things organized. Looking towards the Central Pacific side. And now they are lining up for the ceremony. And one of my best sources is a book by Bain. And I think his description uh, is, is poetic of, of this moment in history, which has got so many uh, firsts about it. So let me just read a, a little bit of that account of the ceremony. This is from David Bain's uh, Empire Express Building the First Transcontinental Railroad. In Washington, a large gathering crowded into the main office of the Western Union Company, where the manager had connected a magnetic ball to the main line and placed it in a conspicuous place. Over at the War Department, Generals Sherman and Rawlins waited by the telegrapher hoping that President Grant would break away from his meetings and join them. In Chicago, Omaha, Philadelphia, Scranton, Buffalo, Boston, New Orleans, and many other cities, the telegraph was fixed to the central fire alarm bells and to gongs in the Western Union offices. And to many, it seemed like an indrawn breath had been taken, anticipating the next event. For all intents and purposes, the entire nation was now connected in one giant electrical circuit. The Western Union manager in Washington tapped out that he was ready. Telegraphers in New York, Boston, and New Orleans instantly answered that they were ready. It was about 12.27 p.m. in the east, 12.20, or 2.27 in the east, 12.27 at Promontory. And there was a sudden clamor at the lines as many offices sent inquiries to the Omaha office at the head of the circuit <clears throat> To everybody, <clears throat> Omaha replied, keep quiet. When the last spike is driven at Promontory, we will say, done. Don't break the circuit, but watch for the signals of the blows of the hammer. There was some trouble in the Chicago office. Somewhere west of Buffalo, a circuit closed. Washington readjusted and again was ready. Watson N. Schilling, sitting at a little table with a telegraph key, right there, <clears throat> tapped out, almost ready, hats off, prayer is being offered. There were 12 or 13 minutes of silence while the Reverend Dr. Todd stood at the joining place and asked the favor of heaven upon the enterprise. At 12.40 p.m. in Washington, the message bell rang again. We've got done praying, Watson tapped again. The spike is about to be presented. Chicago replied, we understand, all are ready in the east. 
The presenters of the ceremonial spikes stepped forward. W.H. Harkness of the San Sacramento Press handing Governor Stanford the inscribed golden spike. There was actually four spikes, two for each side, CP and UP. Sedgwick exposed a photograph of the ceremony from about 30 yards away across the sagebrush, catching the crowd in a large knot between the two engines. Two of the telegraph men had climbed the ladder leaning against the pole to get a better view from above. One had now perched on the cross piece, holding onto the flagpole. The breeze was out of the west, and the flag was rampant. Now Stanford was responding on behalf of the Central Pacific, accepting the gifts and expressing in spectacularly dull sentiments that these gifts shall receive a fitting place on the superstructure of our road. The governor went on and on. And if anyone there began to measure the distance between the iron rails and the nearest tent purveying red jacket by the shot, their attention would have finally snapped back to the central scene as Stanford rose to perhaps his greatest oratorical moment when he said, in conclusion, <laughs> he announced, raising the spirits of the assembly and on and on. It was a hard act for Chief Engineer Dodge to follow. He may have been an active backroom kind of politician in Des Moines, Council Bluffs, and Washington, but he was a man of action, not of words. And when he responded for the Union Pacific, he kept it short. In Washington, the clerk in the Attorney General's office, Walt Whitman, yeah, would avidly devour all press accounts of the ceremony later in the year, beginning with his magisterial poem, Passage to India. Samuel Reed and James Stowbridge lowered the laurel tie and the squads of Chinese and Irish tra track layers put down the last two rails, their foremen quickly fixing them in place. Stanford and Durant dropped the precious spikes in their slots and the laborers having forgotten Having gotten the two last common iron spikes started in the wood, the governor stood at the south rail and the doctor at the north, half the world at their backs, as Bret Hart would write. Telegrapher Schilling tapped out a message, all ready now. The spike will soon be driven. The signal will be three dots for the commencement of the blows. All that was required was that each of them make a light tap with their hammers. In many subsequent, account, subsequent accounts, it was imaginatively and derisively alleged that both missed their swings. There's no contemporary evidence of that. The doctor raised his hammer. The governor raised his silver maul. They looked at telegrapher Schilling, who tapped three dots and said simply, okay. And the work was done. As simultaneously as distance and the speed of electricity permitted, a 15-inch gun overlooking Fort Point in the Pacific, connected by underground wire to San Francisco City Hall, thundered with striking of all the fire bells in the city. In City Hall Park in New York, a hundred cannons rattled in the windows of lower Manhattan while bells at Trinity peeled forth, answered by other churches and fire gongs. <clears throat> The train yards in Sacramento, all the locomotives thrilled with cannons booming. In Omaha, every Union Pacific engine steam whistle opened up, joined by a hundred cannons, bells, gongs, and full-throated cheers, and it goes on and on. In Chicago, tens of thousands poured into the streets at the sounding of fire alarms with only a minimum of advanced preparation, and commenced the largest and most enthusiastic parade in that city's history, which would stretch fully seven miles. It was free, the Chicago Tribune editor would comment, from the atmosphere of warlike energy and suggestions of suffering, danger, and death, which threw their oppressive shadow over the celebrations of our victories during the war for the Union. Church bells and fire alarms rang over Iowa City, alerting Peter Day, at Locust Hill, near the soldier's home in Washington, the clamor from the Capitol would have reached Asso Whitney. In Greenfield, Massachusetts, the bells of St. John's Church were heard by Anna Judah, 
who had refused herself to all visitors and stayed home alone to read and reflect that day, May 10th, her wedding anniversary. It seemed as though the spirit of my brave husband descended upon me, she recalled, and together we were there unseen, unheard of man. As the assembly at Promontory let forth in cheer after cheer and Leland Stanford hardly shook the hand of Thomas Clark Durant and Durant exclaimed, there is henceforth but one Pacific Railroad. Cheers followed for the engineers, the contractors, the laborers who'd done the work, but of course the names of Day, Judah, and Whitney went unsaid. The two locomotives drew together until their pilots were all but touching and the two engineers mounted the pilots to touch celebratory champagne bottles while other men climbed all over the locomotives to stand or lean against the warm iron flanks triumphantly. Grenville Dodge and Samuel Montague stood below them at the edge of the track and shook hands. Andrew Russell exposed the most famous photograph of the day. I see, I've got a lot more, but we've expired an hour, so that would be a good place to stop if, <laughs> if you've had more than enough. Is any part of the Transcontinental Railroad in use today, or has it all been abandoned and done the right way? Well, uh, both is true. There are large parts of the right-of-way that are the same. In fact, there are some tunnels on the CP that are still being used. Um, <clears throat> lots of it, though, has been relocated. Uh, the main line from Omaha across Nebraska and Wyoming is, uh, well, for parts of it, it's triple track and extremely busy. A little less busy now. The coal business is way off. But, um, yeah, it's an active and very important railroad. Yeah. You said that the uh, Union Pacific charged, what, $50,000 a mile? How much did the Central Pacific get paid since they had to cut through the mountain? Well, they got paid more, uh, and that was a big argument. Uh, they were always fighting about, um, okay, they were going to get paid, I don't know, 90000 per mile in the mountains. Where does the mountain start? And, okay. you know, they're lobbyists there in, in, in Washington, Huntington, I guess it was. Um, he made sure the congressman understood that, you know, we need $90,000 from this point over here. And same is true of the Union Pacific. They had to go over some hills. And um, so that was a constant argument. Is this flat or is this, you know, mountains? Yeah. So a lot of the activity was that kind of fighting back and forth. You know, and they were fighting uh, even about, okay, they, at one point, one of the rules was we, we can't, you, you can't survey more than 300 miles ahead of where you, you're building track. Understandable. You don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. And part of that was to make sure that one side didn't take unfair advantage of the other side, getting to the meeting point. You know, if you go out there and claim you've surveyed all this territory. So 300 miles. Central Pacific had a season where <clears throat> all but well, a few miles up over the top and through one tunnel was snowed in. They couldn't work on it. So since they couldn't work up there, they worked out across the Nevada desert. And they'd say, okay, we're 300 miles from here. Union Pacific said, no, 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 no. You, know, you got some, a gap there. You know? And so they were fighting about this stuff all the time. Well, what does it take to make sure uh, you know, that you, you know, this gap doesn't prevent it? Well, you know, a few shares of stock might help. You know? <laughs> yeah. Was the telegraph built at the same time they built the uh, railroad? Like there was a transcontinental telegraph that had a different route that was opened in 1861, which pretty much shut down the Pony Express. It kind of followed the Pony Express route. But as they were building the railroad, they installed telegraph just you know for their communications and when they joined 
that, that got to be the telegraph line because it was so much easier to maintain if you're right next to the railroad track. Yeah, from, so from 1861 to present day, you had electronic communication with California. But I think what is so neat about this Golden Spike ceremony, I think it's the first time that everybody in the country was, you were hearing those taps and the message done. And what I wanted to, uh, you know, some of the, let me just skip ahead here. Uh, um, here is the Union Pacific's um, celebration of the centennial, or 150 years, the, the big boy, which they um, restored just in time for this. And their other uh, northern, 484, 844, met. Here's an inset. Remember the telegraph message when it was all done? Was done. 150 years later, it's hashtag done. <laughs> so yeah, did you get a chance to see the big boy? That was an amazing sight. Yeah. Where are the golden spikes now? Ah, there is one of them that uh, is in the Stanford Museum, and this is the one that uh, was presented to Stanford, there were four ceremonial spikes made. And this is the only one I could find that you could actually go to a museum and look at it. And this was uh, sort of offered by the state of Nevada to the event. Now, they were careful as soon as they got those things in, you could take them back out, <laughs> uh, because all those people there where uh, they had their pocket knives out and they were getting pieces of that uh, last tie. <laughs> that didn't last long. <laughs> that was gone <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. Uh, a little known fact, when Stanford swung at that spike, he missed. No, he did not miss. Um, this is something that's been uh, propagated but there isn't any contemporary evidence that backs that up. But that is a story that's repeated. It was documented a couple months ago. Oh, well. So, I mean, that's from. I know a lot of people you would think are good authors, like. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, but there's a website on the uh, CP uh, Historical Society, CPRR.org, um, that go through all these myths, especially. The book, um, Nothing Like It in the World, just incredible errors and things that are not right. But yeah, I was going to talk about that a little bit. That was my last slide, all the horrible stuff that has been. Uh, but uh, one of the authors that's been really good for going back to original sources and see if these stories are true or not is the David Bain book. That's why uh, and that was published in 1999. Very good book. Anything else? Okay.